My colleagues, I will try to speak today in English because Joe did not allow me to speak Spanish like yesterday. I think my Spanish was too bad. So therefore, therefore, and also he, he added that you probably are not so much used to English, so it is better that I speak English. But I tell you, my English is a very strange English. It's a Chinglish, German English, and you shouldn't imitate me because you should improve. So my, my intention is to give a few messages on the, on the field of, of the economy. Because the problem with the economy, uh, how it was analyzed in the past in the Western countries, in particular in the United States, was a very strange way of analysis. And I would like to undermine this point of view and bring up another one where change in history is possible because the mathematical models in the mainstream economy in the United States and also in, in the UK uh, are given in a way that history does not exist. There is a behavior of individuals uh, maximizing her, his utility or maximizing his, her profit, and that's all for constituting a society. In my view, this is a wrong view, and it will be outdated, and it was outdated in history because the system we are in, in the economy, will not stay here forever, and in particular, the symptoms of the crisis we feel now, here in Spain in particular, but also in Greece and in Portugal, and for a certain, uh, on, a, on a certain level also in Austria, this situation is one that indicates that this system of economic reproduction will not last forever. So I will try to reconstruct the economy in a certain way. And for this, I will do some steps like this one. At first is a kind of theory of reconocimiento. <laughs> uh, where are we now? We are always in a circle of change. And I think this is the situation we are in. And we have in this circle, we have at the one side, we have the outer world. And we do not really know what is there. We see the sun, we see our colleagues, we see our human beings, but we see them through uh, a looking glass, uh, through spectacles, where we are distorting the real world. And the message is, we do not have any, nobody has any direct access to the real world. This is unfortunate, but it is a reality, and we have to live with it. And so what shall we do? And the way out was uh, via our brains, on the one hand side, reflecting what is around us in a primitive way, on the other hand, inventing and designing the images of the world around us. And in this dialectical interface of uh, making images, but also constructing the world outside, this is the way how we function and how we live. And I think this is a, it's a very important message. I didn't believe that when I started studying electronics. I didn't believe that. I said, uh, I thought the way outside, the, the world outside is given and we know because the physical laws are there and we know how the, uh, the laws of electricity uh, are organized and that's it. And this is the objective world. But Later on, I found out that every year or every two years or every 10 years, the world changed because new theories came into the world and the world changed by that. So it doesn't mean that the world really changed the world outside, but our image and our understanding of the world is changing. So what is going on? We produce ideas, and this is uh, shown in symbols, uh, very strange mathematical symbols, and these symbols uh, will be shared with others, and then there is a diffusion of new ideas, 
and there is interaction of other people because nobody can, as a, as a single individual, change the world. It is very difficult to do that. And there is interaction, and then there is a transformation of the ideas into practice. And I think this is the second message I wanted to, to tell you, that without practice, uh, only with theory, you cannot understand the world. And there is, I think Leibniz has said, uh, Theoria Compraxi, it's, uh, it's the banner of the Leibniz Society in Germany I'm a member of. Uh, therefore, I think always you have to, to see what is really going on, what is, is going on in practice, and you will be changed by the practice uh, if, even if you don't know, you will be influenced. So, uh, on the other hand, we, we change the, our, our world by work. Uh, the symbols there is banking, industry, uh, computers, etc. And of course, uh, much manual labor is needed also. And by this, the world is changed. And then we see the world in a new way. And then the circulo de cambio is going on. But this is a very uh, simple one, and science uh, has another one. There's a bypass for science. The scientific understanding is that you use certain methods and certain rules, sometimes also the computer, to reconstruct the world and reconstruct it in a way that you can understand and communicate better. But of course, if you analyze the scientific images of the world, for instance, of firms, you can see that always there are uh, uh, obstacles, there are distortions, there are changes, there are pictures which represent more the interests of the people and of the persons uh, and their situation where they are in than any objectivity. And I think this is also very important to be understood by you that you do not believe uh, very uh, rapidly into such images of the world. I think this is the basis of criticism. But if you have good images of the reality and you have also developed new steps for the future and you plan that and you do it together uh, on a democratic basis, probably the, the world can be changed to the better. This was the introduction. Uh, how. Uh, I see uh, the world, and it was very helpful for me, but it's a result of many disappointments, because I, I believe that the world is quite simple, and if you do mathematical forecasting, and you, if you do statistical methods, you will know what will be in the future, and this is completely wrong. So, next one. Uh, this is the master plan, how I reconstruct the economy. And you have to read this picture from the bottom to the top. Uh, and this is inspired by Marx's writings. Marx has said that if you do science, you cannot do it just from the surface. You cannot just look at this and say, I understand what are the laws behind it. You have to go from a very abstract level and you have to start there. And from this abstract level, you have to add additional uh, features of the world, and finally, probably, and hopefully, you end up at the surface level and you understand the situation better. And we will do an exercise to go through the different steps I see in the economy. Probably there are many images possible, and maybe this is not the best one, but you are here, you will improve that. And uh, I will add also empirical data uh, to um, explain what is going on there and of course I take it from Austria because this is very close to me. So the first level is very very abstract. This is, phys is the physical basis. The physical basis on level one downstairs says that there are just things around us and these things are eaten and consumed but we have just a, co connection, a, a collection of things and they are physical things and even that is norm normally neglected in economic science because all the questions of the ecology, of pollution, of energy overconsumption is not taken in these theories. Recently, since the 1960s, we see some branches 
of ecological economics and others. But in, the, in principle, still the mainstream economists, they neglect these parts. So the, the next layer, this is the very abstract layer. Of course, you cannot have just uh, things uh, to analyze the situation. Always things uh, are produced. And for this is the second layer there, that things are produced by human labor. People have to work to reproduce themselves. And in this way, they create also uh, enterprises, maybe single person enterprises in a very abstract uh, picture. And on, on this level, they start to reproduce themselves by changing nature, by extracting uh, substances from, from the soil, by preparing electronic devices, by producing consumer goods, etc. And you see a circle which is the reproduction of the uh, economic life. Uh, yesterday, I already have given the basis. This means that you shouldn't exclude any of your compatriots from this circle because this will fight back. And if you do not have a distribution of work and of wealth, of money and of hours, uh, you are busy. I think in this way you cannot uh, continue and you cannot have an, a successful uh, economy uh, which is sustainable. This is impossible. So this circle should uh, show that there is an, an overall uh, movement of reproduction. And if you reproduce more in the next period, then you have an extended reproduction. If you stick to the same level, you have a simple reproduction. And as I am a mathematician, I have started to analyze such uh, uh, circles by mathematical methods. And there is a quite nice theory. It was developed by Mr. Leontiev in the United States. And I had the opportunity to work with him. And it is called input-output analysis. This input-output analysis shows the connection between the different branches of the economy and uh, it gives a kind of accounting scheme of what the single industry is using from other industries and what uh, do they contribute to consumption, investment, and uh, other commodities, uh, intermediate, intermediary commodities. And Marx has added some other things because he has added the notion of value, of valor. I have yesterday spoken about this. I will not go into details. I will just tell you that I have uh, analyzed uh, the contemporary Austrian economy with his methods, and I will show you some of the results, which is rather surprising. So now the first slide on the empirical situation in Austria. And we speak about labor, of course, and you see the line from the left lower corner 1950 to the upper uh, corner 2010, and there's an overall increase of employment. Employer uh, uh, has increased always, but at the same moment, and this is also an interesting development, you can see the blue line, and this is unemployment. And you see that in the 70s, in 72 or so, we had in Austria 50,000 unemployed, <coughs> which is completely, uh, you, you cannot uh, imagine this now, because we are now at a level of more than five times more, and the trade unions are rather quiet. Uh, in the 70s, they were very loud. They went on strike and did a lot of manifestations, but now there is no <coughs> strong change. So this is one side that <coughs> Uh, the <coughs> oh, yeah, thank you. <coughs> oh, sorry. So the next slide should show what kind of the, the work of, of what kind the work is. Thank you. The first slide, uh, upper left corner, shows the difference by gender, and you see that more men are working, but working outside the house. Uh, in reality, of course, women are working inside the households uh, more than the men, usually. And on the other hand, you can see, this is the slide up there right, that women in particular have a very precarious life 
because more than 40% now is this 45% uh, in part-time situation and their salary is below the level of poverty. So this is rather a strange thing. Uh, with men, it is much better. There are only 5 to 7% now, but the tendency uh, towards precarious work is increasing for both uh, sexes. The same is true for part-time work. This is the slide in the middle. You see once again, although women are less than men uh, in employment, uh, the part-time workers of women are six to seven hundred thousand, and men only one hundred thousand people. And our overall uh, em uh, employment is around uh, more than three million. So, and now I show you what I have done with Marxian methods. You see some beautiful pictures. This is the economy of Austria with 57 uh, branches of production. And you can see the distribution of the so-called circulating capital, uh, variable capital, and value added. And in Marxian terms, all the Marxists know C plus V plus M is W, the, va the value of a commodity. Uh, so you see, you can apply uh, also these methods, and you can see that all the results of the production uh, is done by labor because uh, this each column means this is 100% of the labor in one branch of production, and the split for the various commodities used for production is seen in different colors. So, this was the first step. We are approaching now the third level, and the third level is a new regime comes into being, and this is a capitalist uh, accumulation. And in this way, there is no longer one circle, one feedback loop, uh, the right one, but there is the left one. And this is a very important uh, picture, I think, how to understand what is the principle of our economy. And you see, while on the right-hand side, the workers and consumers are doing more or less always the same and earning more or less always the same, uh, the left uh, circle is an accumulation circle. Everything what is, what is coming out on the left-hand side, the so-called investment goods, is accumulated in, in industries, in fabrics, in new houses, and on this level, uh, a group of people becomes richer and richer and richer. The exception are uh, uh, war or crisis. And this has happened actually that capital will be devaluated in, in times of crisis. But one shouldn't forget that these two circles are always working and even we have a more balanced situation, still it goes on that a group of people is becoming richer and richer and the others, they work and will receive more or less the same, depending on the level of technology and of the level of the fights between the two groups of the left and the right circle. So Marx has analyzed also in uh, volume two a situation where he said, when will the competition between the different firms come to an end? And you can simulate it, and I did it, and then you see uh, that uh, you will get a new structure uh, of the values. Uh, I will not go into details, and you can see the new structure of values where all the branches of production are in competition, but they reach then the same rate of profit, so that they, there is no need for moving from one branch to the other anymore. This is the list of branches. I do not deal with that. And the next is the result. Maybe this is some, something uh, interesting for you. Uh, what do you think if you do social science in any form? Have you heard about the notion of correlation coefficient? Yeah? Who has heard about it? One, two, oh, three. The correlation coefficient is a measurement between two, uh, two lines uh, in time. So if there is the correlation coefficient of one you will have if the two lines go parallel in time. They, they need not have the same level, but they go parallel, they go proportional. 
maybe each uh, of the lines is two times uh, more than the, the other line. So then you have a correlation of one. This means very good. And if you have a forecast, a prediction, uh, and you approach by a correlation coefficient of one, you have a complete prediction of the real uh, world, uh, and this is a very, very good result. The other way around is if you have a correlation coefficient of zero, this means that the changes in one variable are completely unconnected to the changes in the other. So this is like random, random. Uh, the third um, non very favorable position is if you have a correlation coefficient of minus one, then you always predict the wrong way. You predict plus one, and the real, uh, real variable is minus one. So you see, this is very bad. And the question is if you have correlation coefficients of very close to one, this is a good result. <coughs> and what I have done is I applied. Mark theory on the Austrian data, and the result was a correlation coefficient if you used the first very abstract level where he didn't deal with capitalism in volume one. He de dealt with <coughs> the first 150 pages with value. What is the value which is explained by prices on the surface? And the result was for the year 2006 of data was 0.8, <coughs> 2003 it was 0.88. And if you do some theoretical modifications, it's even worse. But if you use the assumption of his idea that capitalist situation is creating competition between the enterprises and the rate of profit is equalized, then you come to a result of nine, uh, point, point 0.94 or 0.95, which is a very, very good result. So you can predict what are the prices in the various branches. But this is very rather simple theory. You can predict with the uh, explanation of the changes by 95%. And I think this is a, an excellent result, which you cannot find in the usual mainstream uh, economic theory. So next one uh, is, once again, we are now in the, in the two circles where uh, competitive activities change the prices because by this method the prices are modified and they are no longer the same prices than before. And this means a new way of doing production, a capitalist way, will change the former stratum on the lower level and will modify the prices. So this is the idea which I follow later on. But first, I would like to show you what is the real-time situation in Austria, where you can compare what are the wages and what is the output of production within the last mm, 12 years. And you can see, once again, a very difficult and very sad story. Uh, the net real wage for women is about uh, 13,000 a year, euros a year, net wage in real terms, inflation is uh, computed away, so it is uh, in real terms. And you can see that 50% higher, uh, this is fine, but it is 50% higher than the wages of the women are the wages of men. They are around 20,000. And this is the first very, very difficult situation. And you can see in Austria, if you follow uh, the past data, down to the 70s, it was always the same. Politicians have spoken, there is a big difference between men and women, and they have implemented laws of equal uh, treatment, etc. But the, the, the difference between the wages hasn't changed at all. So this is one sad story. The other sad, maybe much more sad story, is the blue line. The blue line is the output of the workers uh, uh, this is called a productivity measure per head. And you see that this line uh, increased by more than 30%. The last uh, breakdown was 2009, where we have seen the crisis. And the demand for goods in this year broke down, in particular in transport and uh, aer aerospace, etc. But the 30, uh, more than 30% increase was not... Uh, recognized by the entrepreneurs, 
by giving them more wages. So on the same level of wage, and of course on the same level of consumption, the state, for all these years. And the question is, where did the difference go to? What is your guess? Where, where did it go to? A good answer of your side would be, it went into capital investment. Because if the entrepreneurs uh, earn much and they have high profits, they could easily invest and the economy will grow. So, uh, we will, uh, first we will, I, will, I will answer this question later on. First I will show you what is the situation between the two groups, Marx called them classes, of workers, salaried workers, and the other groups, and you can see that the wage share on the total economy, this is a relative measure, it is not an absolute measure, is going down all over the years, there was only an, an ex exception in the crisis years, but it is going down as well. And this is not only so in Austria, this is also so in most of the OECD countries, and I bet that it is the same in Spain. <laughs> and this means, that although uh, the workers have produced more and more, there is no result for them to buy more or to, to receive more money. On the contrary, we see that the, the, the working poor is coming up, people who are working but do not earn enough to survive. And so this is a real big problem and we have uh, a situation like in the uh, developing world and we, we have also pockets of poverty in the rich uh, regions of Vienna and also of New York, and I'm not sure how it is here, but I think in Madrid we have more or less the same. So, and now the question comes, uh, if the firms have earned more, uh, and this is called, it is called, it is just in German, it is the profit, uh, the profit share, it is called the profit share, this is the share of profits on the GDP, on the gross national product. And you can see the trend line that this went up. So this is the direction where the money went. But on the other hand, uh, entrepreneurs could be very happy that this is a good development. We will invest more. On the other hand, they didn't invest more. They invested less. And what we see in Germany is very interesting. Since 2002, I have, to, I have to tell you a, bit, a little bit more that normally uh, the entrepreneurs are this group who has the highest debt rate because they take credits from the banks in Germany, also in Austria. Uh, they invest and with the profits they have, they pay back. And this worked very well, but uh, although the entrepreneurs said, well, we do not earn enough, we have to have a new tax law in favor of us, and uh, then we will have more profits, then we will invest more. What has happened in real terms was, since 2002, the, the net debt is no longer negative as it was before, so they had more credits, then they had uh, financial wealth. It changed, and now the entrepreneurs in Germany have 0.2% excess money, they do not need any credits because they have so much money and they do not invest. 02 of the GDP uh, in plus is now the level of the entrepreneurs. And I, I checked this also for Austria. In Austria it came later. And it would be very interesting to invest, investigate here what is going on here. Uh, I wouldn't be very surprised if this is not the same reason, uh, if, if this is not the same result because uh, although there is crisis overall, uh, this, this change is not meaning that the crisis is for the entrepreneurs. It is just for, the, uh, for, for everyday people. So, we are now on the level of capitalist uh, consumption. This is level three in, in the triangle I showed you. Uh, next is, uh, we add uh, financial capital. And here, uh, is a new way of uh, the importance of financial capital. Of course, we have had also in 100 years ago, we have had banks and the finance states, and uh, this was, of course, a, a, an important instrument. 
But during uh, the 1920s, 1920s, uh, because there were new inventions in electricity machines and in, uh, in power plants, there, there, it was necessary to collect more capital and banks uh, created the capital in cooperation with the firms and by that it was possible to bring up more money and to do this big investment. And there was Mr. Hilferding, an Austrian, he called this uh, finance uh, capital or finance capitalism. So this was a modification where a new level, layer of, of banking systems of uh, credit institutions came up and uh, changed all the other lower layers so that capitalism was not the same as before. And I show you what in real terms this meant for Austria. This is a, uh, it's, it's a graph from 2006, but the change was not a very big since, which says how many percent of the people in Austria uh, have how many percents of property in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Immobilien, uh, uh, im immobiliarias, no? immobiliarias, or in herencias, in, in uh, heritage. And you can see that the blue line says 40% of the people in Austria that do not have any property in houses or in soil. More than 40%. Here the, the curve starts uh, at around 45%. Uh, but the worst is the question of herencias. Even more than 80% uh, do not inherit anything. So all the campaigns now of the leftist groups, they say we have to tax uh, herencias e-property. Usually people think they will be, they will suffer. And the majority of people think if they have a small house, uh, this will be taxed away and they will be, cannot live anymore in this house. Which is in some cases it's, it's true, but not by taxes, uh, but by the banks, because they take them away after the immobilien, uh, immobiliaria crisis. Okay. But in Austria, people, the normal people are afraid of higher taxes and therefore they vote against. Even, uh, as you can see here, that only 20% of the population would, would really suffer. And if they have so much money they have, they will not really suffer. So, next layer. Uh, I will show you, this is a, a graph which shows what is the engagement of banks uh, of Austria with other countries. And you can see in the second row there, Spain is there. And you see, the big sums Austrian banks lend to Greece and Spain and Portugal, and this is, is the, of the order of magnitude of uh, 200 million, 200 million euros. And Austrian bankers are very much afraid about the behavior of Spain and of Greece because they will lose 200 million. Uh, euros in, in Greece a little bit more, maybe around 500 million euros. But you have to look at the last line here, where I tried to add all the credits to the enlargement countries in the East, the Austrian banks are engaged with. And this is the incredible sum of 358 <coughs> billion, billions by 1,000 more uh, to these countries. And the banks in Austria are very silent about this because this creates big risk. And if the credits they cannot pay back, if the if the uh, economic development will not work fine, uh, this will be this will be a disaster. And I'm sure this disaster will will go also to the German bank, and uh, this this will be a, a very very difficult situation. So I'm rather pessimistic of the situation here in Europa. And the Spanish situation is, compared with this, is peanuts for Austria, for Austria, although it is very difficult. Next one. 
the next level, uh, uh, in addition, is the public sector. And uh, Lenin analyzed this new layer as state monopoly capitalism, where the state and the banks and the enterprises work together. And this meant that during wartime, this was necessary that uh, European states, uh, for being the vict victories, have a victory, they tried to invest in private enterprise and to, to assist banks, etc. Finally, it went to a big inflation after the wars. But in, in the very first beginning, there was state monopol uh, monopolistic capitalism as a successful, quote unquote, situation. And what we can see now, once again, an empirical situation, you can see that the public debt in Austria uh, increased uh, very uh, rapidly, and now our debt level is around 75% of the GDP. I think in Spain it's a little bit more, but you know in the United States the debt level is more than 100% and is increasing, so, it, so this is not a, a, any argument. So, uh, I'm now nearly ready with my contribution, and I will speak about the last layer, the, the uh, layer on the top I call information society. Uh, I think all the layers before showed that changes were introduced by the new layer and the new way of capitalist accumulation uh, was introduced. And the last one, in my opinion, is the introduction, introduction of information society with the information processing machinery, uh, which is, con is uh, uh, used in three ways. You can use it as a standalone uh, machine, like a laptop or a, an ordinary computer. You can use it together with the uh, working machinery of the Industrial Revolution for creating uh, the automaton, so that the machinery can do uh, on its own, can, can can create improved uh, productivity without any action by human beings. And the third and most modern and interesting is, of course, the connection of the information processing machinery via the internet or via mobile uh, communication, cellular telephones. And the result of this situation is once again an ambivalent situation. You could have, on the one hand side, you could have more surveillance, more control, you could have more exploitation via international uh, funds, you could have also, and this has happened, an increase of finance capitalism towards finance market capitalism. This is a fine difference. And this means that the control of the enterprises, of a few enterprises now, is more or less fully in the hands of financial capital. I can give you a quotation of that. But on the other hand, there is hope for us, meaning that we could use the media, uh, social media, for a democratic change. And I think this is the positive end of my contribution. And I will show you what a recent study says. This was a study about 194 countries uh, with about 43,000 transnational companies. And they found out, by analysis of graph theory, they found out that only 50 companies, and they identified them. You, you can find the, the study in the internet. I think you have quoted this also in a, in a Facebook. Probably this was the, the, the study. Uh, 50 countries, uh, uh, 50 com companies are controlling 40% of the global value of the firms. And all 50 are part of the finance industry or are very close to it. None of them is a classical production company. And this indicates that there is another big change and we should look uh, at this change and to understand uh, it as soon as possible and go forward uh, towards new lines. So my last slide. Uh, 
says, each of the layers here bring in a new uh, performance of the capitalist system. At each of the new layers, you have the possibility of change. I give you some examples. For instance, if the uh, state monopoly capitalism comes in with the public sector on layer five, this means you could have a democratic welfare state like we have had during the last uh, 30, 40 years in the Western European countries and in Austria too. But you could have also a possibility where the state is controlled by a single party in the socialist countries. And you could uh, have also a fascist development. So you see what I mean. You could use the scheme for seeing different developments and, and uh, turning points or uh, branching points where history could change in, in its quality. And this is my message. And with the new layer, dominance comes in. The question is what kind of dominance? Is it controlling the rich or is it controlling the poor? Uh, uh, and the history is going up, and all these layers are still there, but they have now, under the situation of finance market capitalism, they have now a new place in the play of, uh, of capitalism. And I think this we have to understand. And here I stop with the last <laughs> graph. Thank you very much.